your presence alone is more than enough to fulfill all of our desires. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit comes to this place and moves around. Christ, we want to declare that your name, just the mention of your name, is more than enough for us.
everything I
and that we can be affirmed with that, that you are great and nothing is greater than you. Okay, so next is going to be a hype song. And we can clap and sing. Except God be with you. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto to thee, Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Seven, marvel not that I said unto thee, he must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listed, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whether it goeth. So, everyone that is born of the spirit, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? 
Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. 12. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? The last verse, verse 13. And no man had ascended up unto heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Praise the Lord. Uh, a reminder of our church's motto. I, I think it's hard to say it too much. Is that we, the church, as followers of Jesus, will love as Jesus loved, will teach what Jesus taught, and will obey as Jesus obeyed. Because Jesus is our example of, of what life is really supposed to be like. And churches should be in the business of helping people become more like Jesus. Uh, an author named Dallas Willard, I, I like so much of his stuff because he talks about that topic of, of helping people be disciples and be like Jesus. And he said, we've generated a body of people who consume Christian services and think that that is Christian faith. But consumption of Christian services replaces obedience to Christ and, and spirituality is just one more thing to consume. And he talks about that being a danger. That it's just, I want to be in a Christian service and now I've, I've lived the Christian life. I've, I've gone to a church service. I've gone to a, a worship conference and this is Christianity. And that sometimes replaces our idea that we're supposed to actually be obedient to Jesus and, and follow the way he lived. So hopefully in, in 2021, if you've never done this before, you'll, you'll avoid the cult of church and just that being your faith. And you'll truly have a faith that, that looks at Jesus and says, I want to follow the way Jesus taught. So that's what we've... Um, been looking at in going through Jesus' life, and we spent really a lot of time on the preparation of Jesus. I mean, we've gone through like four months, and we're only in the third chapter of John. We haven't got very far, and yet so much of that preparation is important. Things like the spiritual disciplines that Jesus went through, or, or baptism, or growing in wisdom, or, or relying on his Father and the Holy Spirit, so much of this is valuable preparation, but preparation has a purpose. And that's to actually then go share this life with others, to do that sort of ministry or outreach. So today, we're, we're starting to look at that. Today is sort of evangelism training. John 3 has so much theology, but it's also one of the first times we see Jesus talking to someone about Jesus which I think is valuable for us to look at. How did Jesus, when he was telling others this good news, what did he say? When he was telling people about himself and, and the Holy Spirit and, and the world as it should be, what did he say? Because there's, there's so much good stuff in the epistles. I, I love Paul's letters and Peter's letters and such, but it's nice to get back to the source and see how did Jesus do this? So, today's looking at some of that, and, and our topic uh, for today is Jesus calls for a reset. He, he pushes that reset button and says, you got to start over again. We start with Nicodemus. We're told Nicodemus comes to Jesus. And there's a few things we know about this man. Because it'll be important, as we see over the next few weeks even, is that Jesus is is good at knowing his audience. And he does talk to people with the same truth, but he brings it across differently for the needs of that individual. And so who is this individual that Jesus is speaking to? Nicodemus, he was wealthy. He's respected. We're told he's part of this ruling council that would have been 70 men from the Jewish culture at that time. That's it's like getting to be in parliament or something like that. It's, it's a big deal. So he's wealthy. He, he calls himself old. Jesus doesn't say he's old. But if Nicodemus calls himself old, we'll say that counts. 
He's wealthy, he's respected, he's old, and he's very religious. We're told he's a part of this group called the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, if you've only read the New Testament, and that's the only time that you've heard of the Pharisees, this has come across bad like so many times. But if you know at least their background, it, it started with at least an, an understandable reasoning. They wanted to be a people who lived by God's laws and, and kept it no excuses. And, and that was from as they read the Old Testament and as they'd seen their people go through times of exile and, and destruction of their cities and lands and they went, man, every time we go away from God's law, bad stuff happens. So we want to make sure we follow God's law as best as we can so that we'll have these good promises God has given. It sounds like a good premise to start with. They did get off track because then they got so stuck on minutia that wasn't truly God's law. So we have in God's law, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And the Pharisees then came up with 24 chapters about what that one sentence means. So even though we'll see throughout the time that Jesus speaks against what they've done with it. When you see Nicodemus as someone who's, who's at least trying to be very religious, he's trying to follow God's laws, that's, that's his mentality coming into this. And he's been doing this for a long time. We're told this Nicodemus, he shows up at night to talk to Jesus. And I don't know, some of the best conversations I've had with people come at night. But it also seems like he's doing this at night so he can be a little less seen. It says, Jesus, Rabbi, we've, we know that you must come from God because you've done incredible things. These miracles and teachings. Now, in our timeline, this has been one week of Jesus doing ministry in public. One week. He'd been baptized, he'd gone into the wilderness, tempted with no one else around, and then he's shown up on the scene in Jerusalem. He threw over some tables at the temple to clearly show he thinks that they need to get back to the basis of what God's heart is for his people. And Jesus had done some miracles. We were only told he'd changed water into wine at a wedding that was somewhere further away, so we don't know what miracles Nicodemus has seen. And he's seen Jesus do miracles, and he goes, well, you must be from God. Aside note, can someone do miraculous signs and not be from God? If you read through the rest of the New Testament, there'll be various places where you see that answer is yes. So don't be just amazed because you see a miraculous sign. You've got to make sure the rest falls through with it. But miraculous signs were meant to by God to get our attention and, and point towards the truth when it was. So Nicodemus says, hey, I, I think you're good, I think you're great, I think you got good stuff to say. This should be good. Now if I were Jesus, like how might I respond to this? Right? Like we had seen back in the whole temple thing, he was throwing over coins and all that, that people weren't happy saying, what authority do you have to do this? And now there's one of the ruling council coming and saying, oh, we know that you're a good guy. We know that you got the right thing going on. I want to give myself a pat on the back and be like, hey, good. Somebody, finally, some of you guys wisened up. Good. I at least like you. This is Jesus' response. Um, unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. Where did that come from? We know you're really wise. Yeah, if you want to see God's kingdom, you have to be born again. Jesus sparks interest. He makes statements that lead to just more questions. 
this one, he, he does get a question. Uh, I'm an old man. Am I supposed to somehow get back into my mom for this to happen? Jesus sparks interest, but he does leave room for mystery. If I'm trying to tell someone about Jesus, I want to be as clear as possible often. And then I read about what Jesus did, and I went, well, sometimes Jesus didn't make clarity his first priority. I'm still trying to figure through why he did some of that. When Jesus, he, he, he sparks this interest, and, and he uses a, a term that then is, what's this idea of born again? Because by now, we've probably heard this several times. If you've been around church, you've heard it. But for him, this was, okay, born again. What is that? Another translation that's appropriate would be born from above. Later in John chapter 3, we're told that Jesus came from above, and it's the exact same word as the born again, born from above. And it's sort of like this word play. So my oldest son, he's learning to read, and learning to read in English as well. It's like Dutch is his main language that he uses the most, but last night we had this book that was in English, and he was doing pretty good. Except I realized, wow, English is harder than I thought it would be, like learning it the first time. So for all of you who have not learned it as a child but had to learn it later, props to you. I respect that. Because someone is like, he comes to a word that has like the word thought, and he's trying to sound it out, and he gets the th, and then there's the O-U. And so like, well, in English, the O-U makes the uh sound sometimes, but sometimes it makes the ow sound, and other times it makes the, oh, this is going to be tough. The word is thought. Just keep going. <laughs> and so, like, I'm trying to help him with this English one, but every few pages they had a joke page, and this was about squirrels, and so they thought it would be hilarious to name this acorn e joke. This is acorns, but it's being a corny joke. Corny being not really funny, like dad jokes. And that's what they had. There's, there's these jokes that have to do with words. About like, what's the same between a ball, which was red in color, and this book? I don't know. They're both red all over. Ha ha ha. But I realized, like, that thing of language, if you don't understand a language well, you won't think it's funny. And if you do understand it well, you still might not think it's funny, I accept that. But you have to know a language well enough to catch the, like, the nuances of meanings, and sometimes a word means two different things at the same time. That's sort of what happens with born again, is that that term born again, it, it has this like born over, but also born from above, and Jesus is probably intentionally playing off of both of these pictures. But Nicodemus definitely gets the idea of, well, this has to happen a second time. I go back to my mom for this? Is that, that's where I came out the first time, so that's, I guess, where I show up the second time? And it's one of the um, funniest it seems like Nicodemus is being a little funny thinking this word picture. But it's also, I think him realizing, or, or he has to start to grapple with there and through the conversation, that Jesus is asking Nicodemus to reset everything. That's all, like, I'm an old man. <laughs> I've been trying to follow the law for years. I've been doing it well, I and now you're saying that all of that is kind of worthless, and I have to start back at zero? Some of us in this room have only lived maybe 18, 19, 20 years. Think about having to redo all 20 of those. Some of us have lived a lot more than that. 
Think about having to redo all of your years or that all of the good stuff that you thought you had been amassing for God to be happy with counted for nothing and you had to restart at zero. Nicodemus is having to grapple with this. Jesus is saying, you, if you really want to see God's kingdom, you want to see his goodness you want to see all those promises you've been hoping for? You've got to start over. You must be born again. Jesus calls for a change. He sparks interest, but he doesn't leave out the challenge as well. And Jesus will challenge people. The third thing he does then in the next verses is he starts bringing in the Holy Spirit in the conversation. Jesus isn't afraid to do that. He says, well, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. It's like a person is born physically of human parents, but they'll be born spiritually of the Spirit. So don't be surprised, I say, you must be born again. Sometimes, just talking about like the idea of there's God the Father and Jesus who is also God and the Son of God and these theological things, these can be tough. Then you bring in the Holy Spirit and have to explain the Trinity and how that goes. That sometimes makes it hard for clarity, so we often try to avoid that when we're telling people about Jesus. But Jesus, he just jumps right in. It's like, by the way, there's Holy Spirit too. The Spirit is, is what's going to help you have this birth. All this physical stuff you've been doing, that just gives birth to physical stuff. But you need something that's more than just physical stuff. You need God's very Spirit to be what brings about this new restart. And Jesus, one thing I... I love about Jesus is how he uses the physical to try to explain the heavenly for us. He uses these parables often, but just picture language, these stories about something that we get to try to explain something that we don't get yet. And for Jesus, all of life was a parable. You could be walking along, there's a fish. Let me tell you a story about a fish that tells you about what God is like. Oh, there's a woman who's sweeping. Let me tell you a story about a woman who's sweeping to show you more of what God's kingdom is like. There's an ear of corn. There's food on a table. There's a dog running around. Let me, let me tell you how those things show you what God wants to teach. And so Jesus uses the picture of being born. So I'm like, okay, let me start there, what you can understand, to try to get you to understand something that hasn't made sense to you yet. Jesus, Jesus knew what normal life was like. He knew how to talk to people. He knew what were things that interacted with them. I think a lot of that is because he, he cared about people. And when we're trying to tell others about Jesus, Sometimes the difficulty is we're just so focused on trying to get them to hear our, our church type stuff that we haven't like, found out what's interesting to them so that we can help them understand from their point of interest to Jesus. Does that make sense? That we try to start them up here and make sure that they understand towards like redemption or something like that instead of starting with stuff that they understand and say, this is how this reminds me of Jesus. This is how this shows God's realities. And try to bring them that way. Because Jesus did so good with that. He talked about babies here. In John chapter 4, he talks about wells and water and stuff that was present and really easy to understand. And so as we try to tell other people about Jesus, my recommendation is 
try to see where people are and find something in their context to help point that towards Jesus and, and heaven's context. But even with that, yeah, sometimes it's tough. Jesus is talking about, you shouldn't be surprised, I'm telling you to be born again. And then Nicodemus is asking more questions. And Jesus says, if you, you're Israel's teacher, if you don't get this earthly stuff, how are you possibly going to get heavenly stuff? There's, there's no one who's gone into heaven to see it except for the Son of Man who came down. The only person who really has seen and gets heavenly stuff is, in Jesus' case, you could say me. He uses that term, Son of Man, talked about it several times over the last months. I guess it's encouraging that people didn't always understand Jesus. So if they don't understand me, maybe I'm in good company. And it's not like I just did something wrong. But with this, Jesus says, okay, I've tried to make it clear, you don't get it, but here's one thing to at least know. I'm the one who knows best. Jesus points to himself. Jesus says, I'm the one who has the authority. I am the authority on this topic. You want to know about heaven? You want to know about God's kingdom? I'm the one who knows about it. In, in conversations about faith and life, and especially if you get onto Christianity then, people can ask tons of questions that get sidetracked on all kinds of other issues. Well, why does God do this? Or well, why do you believe this? Or, or what's this moral issue? And how does that go with it? The first recommendation is start pointing to Jesus as often and as regularly as possible. Say, let's look at Jesus now. Because as Christians, we, can, we should not be any less or any more exclusive than Jesus was. But the way Jesus was ex exclusive is it had to go through him. He said, I, I'm, I'm, no one else has done this, just me. I'm the one who knows. Later Jesus would say, I am the door. I am the gate. And say, no one comes to the Father except through me. And we as, as people of Jesus should be saying the same thing, that Jesus, this has got to go through Jesus. And, and our current society tries to be very broad and open and, oh, there can be lots of different ways, or there's lots of good stuff that we get from all these different faiths and religions, and I'm not saying there aren't any redeeming qualities that are shown because of God's image in humanity. Well, we still got to go through Jesus eventually. I remember being in one of our uh, youth group meetings. So there was teenagers and brought the verse in, in John 10 where Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And I said, does that sound pretty exclusive to you? And one of these very bright, intelligent, probably 16, 17 year olds said to me, yeah, I think there's lots of different ways. I'm not asking what you think of this. Did Jesus sound like he was being exclusive? No, no, I don't think so. No one comes to the Father except through me. That sounds really exclusive. But if we don't want to hear it, we won't. But if we do, we might just understand the truth of what God's kingdom is like. Why is all of this important? Because I want people to get through that door of Jesus. I know 
what it's like outside of God's kingdom, and I know what it's like inside of God's kingdom, and I think it's really good to be inside God's kingdom, but I want people to get through that door so that they can be there with me. Earlier this week, I had gone into my uh, office for my other job. We're, we're careful, not everyone comes in at the same time, and we make sure that there's uh, distancing and such, but I'd, I'd been in there, and uh, one of my other colleagues and I were then leaving the office and walking back to the train so that we could come back to Maastricht. I know how long it takes me to get to the train from the office. So many times it, I will wait to the last minute that I have to leave because I know I can make it in four minutes if I have to. So I know how long it takes. Um, but we left a little earlier because not everyone likes sprinting for the train like I do. So he left earlier, I caught up with him, and we're walking along, but I'm noticing there's some time, and I asked him, still a long way off, you think we're going to make it in time? I said, yeah. I don't think so, and if we need to, we can run a bit at the end. But I'm at least trying to give my little hints, like, shall we just walk across the grass here, because that's a shorter route than having to go around on the sidewalk and all this. And so, okay, yeah, yeah, let's do that. And so, we're at least taking some shortcuts to get there. And eventually we get to the spot where there's like a road that leads uh, perpendicular to the train. And so before you get to the train, if there's a train that's going to be coming through, such as the one we're gonna ride, you'll have the like red flashing lights and then the slot bone, the like arm will come down and say, don't cross so you don't get hit by the train. So we're walking down this road towards it and there are some houses, so you can't see if the train is there yet. But I was paying attention, and I saw a woman start to run. That was a good, I don't know, 50 meters in front of me. But that's not a good sign. Because if she's running, she's running for a reason. So I start running. And I don't know what the other guy is doing. I just know I want to be on that train. As I'm running, flashing red lights start to go off, but there's still like a few seconds before the like, arm starts to go down. I am going to admit, I will sometimes run across a flashing red light thing if the arm has not gone down. This was one of those circumstances. <laughs> but there's like the arm on both sides. So like the first side, the arm had not started going down. On the second side, it did, but I like, Stuck my head around that and went, but I see that the train is there. I, I make sure that I put my card in so that I pay for it, that way I don't get in trouble when I'm on the train. And I stay close enough behind the person in front of me that I know if they can get in, then the door will stay open long enough for me to get in. So I've run and I'm able to get onto the train. But I hadn't put my mask on yet, and you're supposed to wear a mask on the train, so I put my mask on the doors closed behind me. I'm, I turned around and I wasn't sure as my colleague crossed this or not because I had got to like that half second of should I not go and there are other people who are actually cautious so I knew he was behind me. Is he, did he cross? Maybe he didn't even cross. And I'm taller than I run more so I was like I, I knew I was faster. I turn around I don't see him but I'm like I should push the button. I, I push the button for the door, but the doors are already locked. And then I see my colleague is there, and he's like looking at me. And then I was just like, come on, man. And I'm like pushing the button, and, and he can't hear me, and he can't see my mouth moving because I have my mask on. And the train just starts going, and he's left waiting for the next 30 minutes. I did quickly like pop my phone and ran from over one side like, I tried, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be a jerk. But as I thought about this sermon, I thought about that circumstance. I don't want people left outside of the door if I could have helped them get in. 
And I can say, well, it wasn't my fault. I, I told him way back in the beginning, are we going to make it in time? I, I tried. I was the one paying attention to a woman starts running. So I'm, I, 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 I did my job. I tried. It's not my fault. But could I have done stuff differently? I'm not going to kick myself about it, but if I could go back, I would do it differently because I would want him to be on the train with me instead of standing out in the cold. Also because I know I can take cold better than he can. And when it comes to the end of my life and I'm standing in the kingdom of heaven, I made sure to put my face mask on. Are there going to be people who are standing outside the door that are like, look at me, like, what was that? How'd you just leave me? And I'll go, I, I kind of told you, but I could have done a little bit more because I truly knew better than you did. So I don't say this is like a guilt-inducing thing, but consider that in your life. Are there people that you could help now make sure that they get through the door into the kingdom of God? Which will require some changes in their life. You don't have to not admit what Jesus said. You've got to reset. And if they say no, they say no, but are there people that you could Help get there. And say, I know where the door is. The door is Jesus. So here's your Jesus life step. Have a conversation this week with someone who, who doesn't follow Jesus, who hasn't found that door, so to speak. And talk to them about starting over in life. Being born again. Asking their thoughts on it, or make an interest sparking comment like Jesus did. But have that sort of a conversation. You don't have to give them all the answers. You don't have to know everything. It's probably good if you know where the door of Jesus is yourself. But to at least spark some of that conversation. We don't know how it ended right on that conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. We'll probably see more of that conversation next week, but we're not told at the end, and Nicodemus said, yes, Jesus, I shall do this. We know that nine chapters later, that none of this ruling council, even though we're told some of them believed, not any of them were really willing to confess Jesus because they were afraid of getting kicked out of their synagogue, out of their religious thing. So it seems like Nicodemus probably believed, but he wasn't ready to make it public. We also then know that chapters later, after Jesus has died, that Nicodemus helps with Jesus being buried as a way of trying to show honor to Jesus. And if, if we can trust the Christian tradition afterward, we know that Nicodemus later did die as a martyr because of the name of Jesus. Where in that step did he get born again? In that process, I don't know for sure. Was it based off of that first conversation? Did it come later down the line? I just know that that was probably a really good start of a conversation that Jesus had. And that may be the same with your colleague, your fellow student, your, your family member. Start talking about starting over in life. This was even really easy right now because you're still in January. It's the beginning of the year. You can talk about starting a new year. Be creative. But start that conversation. And if it doesn't end that day, fine. But at least start it. Yeah. And I'm sure there could be lots of questions left over from today. I haven't explained everything greatly, but that's part of where looking through Jesus' life will hit on more of those things as we go.
But for now, let's let's pray and let this simmer. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son to show us the way back to you. Thank you for being willing to be honest about the changes that would have to happen in our lives. And I pray that we would be willing to push the reset button. Be willing to to trust your Holy Spirit to put a new, growing, continuing life in us. That we wouldn't rely on our physical work to make a, a second physical birth, but we would trust your Holy Spirit to be spiritually renewing us day by day. That help us to understand you better, Jesus. That way we can help others. And I pray for the people that are on our minds right now that when we speak to them that we would be able to give them something worth listening to but that those, those friends of ours, those colleagues of ours, that they would have ears that are, are willing to hear and eyes that are willing to see the truth about Jesus. May we be people who continue in prayer for them and continue showing your love and truth in action in front of them so that they can have a picture of what the kingdom of God is meant to be like. In the authority of Jesus' name we pray. Amen.